Hey there chemists, it's Dr. O'Malley here and welcome to AP Chemistry. This is a course that's meant to be similar to a first year college chemistry class, but really meant to prepare you for a college level chemistry class. Uh, we will also prepare for the AP exam toward the end of our academic year. It is demanding, I find it very rewarding. It answers the why to so many questions about chemical phenomena that we see around us in our everyday lives. Uh, if you do your work and you participate, I guarantee you will succeed and I hope you will have some fun along the way. Now, chemistry is the study of matter and how it changes. So here I have just a small candle in front of us that's already lit, uh, and that's a combination of several physical and chemical changes. Wax, which is primarily a large hydrocarbon, is being melted into the liquid phase. The liquid actually vaporizes as it wicks up the wick. Uh, and it's the vapors right at the edge of the wick that are igniting, and we see that in the form of hot particles that are not combusting, and that's what gives off light. So much chemistry happening right in a simple little candle. And I'm using this to illustrate the principle of another chemical substance called cellulose. So here I have a piece of what looks like cellulose that's, you know, just paper that we can get from trees. Uh, however, this cellulose is special. It's been turned into what's called nitrocellulose. And nitrocellulose is what you get when you react cellulose with nitric acid and sulfuric acid. There's the structures there in front of you. Uh, and the difference between nitrocellulose and cellulose is that nitrocellulose already has oxygen chemically connected to the cellulose architecture. So if I were to try to combust regular cellulose, you probably already know paper is combustible, but nitrocellulose can burn even in the absence of oxygen. I can't prove it to you here because there's plenty of oxygen around me, but it will burn very differently than an ordinary piece of paper and we can ignite it right in front of us and see a very different chemical reaction than what we're used to seeing with ordinary cellulose. So this course is meant, chemistry is meant to, to learn how to speak the language of chemistry and be able to explain phenomena like the one we just saw and ultimately learn how to use chemical reactions for the benefit of society. How do we make useful materials for textiles or novel drug candidates to treat illness? They're really infinite applications, I would say, of the chemical sciences. But to start off, we need to be able to speak the language. So today is primarily devoted to just a quick introduction, really a review, I hope, of some things you learned in the past from your chemistry class. There is a grid of what's gonna be our alphabet for chemistry. This is a blank periodic table. And today we're just gonna talk about some clusters of the elements and some of the properties that they exhibit. Now, if you wanna challenge yourself, maybe you could hit pause and see if you could fill in, if you have those notes in front of you, some of the locations of the elements of the table. You certainly do need to you do not need to have all of them memorized for the purpose of this class, but you'll eventually know where a bunch of them are. So go ahead and hit pause if you want to and come back and check. Okay, Let's see how you did. There is a complete table with all 118 elements filled in from hydrogen down to agonison 118. Fun trivia fact for you, there are currently 118 elements on the periodic table at the time of this video, and that's the number of islands in the city of Venice, I've been informed. So I can remember one by just remembering the other. Choose which one you want. So what are we gonna do today? Well, let's talk about some clusters of those elements. Um, seven of them exist as diatomic species in their, in their elemental state, and you should know which seven of these, as a pure element, exist as diatomic. So there's that symbol X2 to remind us that we really never find these particular elements in their monoatomic form. Uh, the diatomics are hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine. And there are some mnemonic devices to remember them. You can actually just spell that out as if it's a made-up word and say it. Hofbrinkel is one thing. Uh, alternatively, I've been taught by some colleagues that you can have no fear of ice-cold beer. That spells out the initials, hydrogen, nitrogen, fluorine, oxygen, iodine, chlorine, and bromine. There's many ways to remember those, but you should know which seven they are. They also sort of make a seven in the upper right corner of the periodic table. If you look at one that's hopefully at the top of your notes, they kind of make a seven up there. Although then don't forget there's hydrogen as well in the upper left. Uh, which elements are gases under standard conditions? There are 11 of these that are gases, and the first six, I hope, are easy to find. They are on the rightmost column of the periodic table, the noble gases. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. Why doesn't he have Oganason on that list? Well, we don't really know enough about Oganason uh, to put it in this category. However, it probably would behave like a noble gas because it fits there based on its atomic structure. But you should know the noble gases just about based on their location in the table. What are the others? Well, there's some of the diatomics that exist as gases. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, and chlorine. This is just under standard conditions. So room temperature and one atmosphere. Obviously, we could physically change any elemental substance to be in a different phase of matter. But those 11 are gases. 
there are only two that in their standard state are liquids and all the others are solids. In fact, many periodic tables are color coded to remind us that which, uh, which elements exist in solid, liquid, and gas under their standard state. Uh, do you know which two are liquids? They are bromine and mercury. Bromine, the diatomic, and mercury, uh, formerly called quicksilver, uh, is, is the liquid, shiny, metallic element that if you ever get the chance to visit Barcelona, you can see this fountain in the Juan Miro Museum in, in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, and if you look closely, that is a pool of mercury that's being funneled through. It's inside a very protected room uh, surrounded by a plexiglass. This was made by Alexander Calder for the 1937 World Exhibition in Paris uh, almost 100 years ago, and it's now uh, in the uh, Fundacio Juan Miro Museum in Barcelona. It's really a fascinating place to see quite a lot of mercury all in one spot, separated by a transparent plexiglass uh, safety shield. So, uh, those are some properties of the diatomics, the gases and the liquids, all the others are solids. I want to zoom in on the periodic table and wrap this up by just talking about how we describe sections of the periodic table, because uh, we've marked them off based on what their columns are called and even some of their rows and other sections. So, first of all, we number the columns left to right, just numerically 1, 2, through 18. Uh, there are some older, more uh, traditional ways of naming them with Roman numerals, and you will still see those, but for this class, we're just going to use numbers 1 through 18. And we should know the name of the first column of the elements, with the exception of hydrogen at the very top, all the metals. In column one, we call the alkali metals. That word means that they form bases when they're mixed in aqueous solution. Very similar word to describe the second column, the entire second column uh, from magnesium down is the alkaline earth metals, uh, also forming basic compounds when they mix with water for the most part. Most metals make bases when you mix them with water. Uh, I'm going to hurdle all the way over to the other side, but before that I'm going to pass what are called the transition metals. That's most of the middle section of the periodic table. So that's columns 3 through 11. Group 12, we actually don't usually call transition metals, and that has to do with the way that electrons are arranged. We'll learn more about that later. Uh, and then the rightmost column, the column that was actually missing from Dmitry Mendeleev's original periodic table, simply because we did not know of their existence because they're so chemically unreactive, those are the noble gases that we mentioned earlier, and I'm going to include the entire column for now. Why not, uh, you know, throw organocin in there, but again, we don't really know much about its properties yet, so it's hard to describe if it's similar to the properties of the other noble gases. Fun fact, we think of the noble gases as never reacting with any other element, and that's not true. The heavier noble gases, the ones like xenon and krypton and rhenon, that have valence electrons that are quite far from its nucleus, you actually can get those elements to react with elements to make compounds. Uh, xenon, for instance, can react with the most reactive element on the table, fluorine, to make xenon tetrafluoride, among other compounds, and it's a very stable solid crystal. So not every noble gas is as unreactive as maybe we learned in our, our first chemistry classes. Helium is certainly the least reactive element. We can't get anything to really react with helium uh, because of its unique stability. Now there's some other sections worth pointing out. The column that's the second to last column in the periodic table, those are called the halogens. That's fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Um, and now I'm going to pan down to the very bottom of the table. What about these two rows that are often drawn below the table? Now those are actually, don't fool, don't fool yourself, those are not a separate part of the periodic table. They are part of the periodic table, uh, just in the interest of space and typically drawing on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. We've removed it from its actual location. It actually gets shoved in between those lower two rows of what we're going to call the S block and the D block. Actually, it's one column over in the past the first column of the D block down there. We'll see more of this later, but you can tell where they belong because you can look at what's called their atomic number. Every element is numbered from 1 to 118, and you can see where that breaks the pattern in the lower left section of the periodic table. Anyway, what do we call them? Uh, well, it starts with lanthanum, so we call them the lanthanides. That's uh, element LA, and right below it are the actinides, starting with actinium. Uh, and they are usually drawn as 14 columns wide, sometimes 15. It depends on which textbooks you might be looking at, if they include it in what we call the F block or if they put them down there otherwise. So, uh, lastly, there is a staircase in, in the rightmost section of the periodic table. We call these the metalloids or the semi-metals. Uh, this more or less separates the divide between the metallic elements on the table, things that have good conduction, 
uh, are very malleable because of their shared delocalized sea of electrons and the non-metals things that are brittle uh, that can react with each other to form molecular compounds or that can react with metals to make ionic compounds and there's a staircase that I'm going to start with boron and work its way down that separates the non-metals from the metals so most of, most of the elements in the trick table as you can see are metals but we should we should know which ones sort of can't make up their mind and that's because their properties are somewhat metallic and somewhat not metallic uh, depending on maybe who else they're bonded to or just what conditions they're under. This would be boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium. So know those six. Some textbooks uh, will we'll put some others in there as well, uh, but I'm going to say that those are the six that we're going to use for this class that we consider to be on the edge. Certainly not black and white though, so the key is to know that it goes from metallic to non-metallic as you go in that direction from the lower left to the upper right of the paper, as do many other trends, but we will get to those later on in the class. Okay, so uh, that's a very short introduction to features of the periodic table. Uh, hopefully that was mostly a review, and uh, you're inspired to continue to learn how to speak this language. We're gonna do a lot of language in the introductory part of this course, uh, and look forward to working together. Thanks for watching.